Tida with us. He has joined us from Chennai. Uh, he is a SPR and he is also a professor of computer science and engineering at IIT Madras. He has done his PhD in computer science, uh, specifically in the area of artificial intelligence from Robert Gordon University, UK. He is also a very close friend of mine, a friend of last 20 years. I have immensely enjoyed his company and learned a lot. He is a rare soul dedicated, completely dedicated to Adhyayan and Adhyapana. Anyway, I request him to share his thoughts on Sri Sitapu's life and philosophy. And you can go up to 8.25. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. My frustrations at the lotus feet of Param Primamai Sri Sri Thakur, Param Aradha Jagud Janani Sri Sri Baroma, Param Pujya Pado Sri Sri Bardha, Param Pujya Pado Acharya Dev Sri Sri Dada, Param Pujya Pado Sri Sri Baba Dada. Can you switch on your video? If noise was there. My heart is dry and Jai Guru to all of you who have assembled here. At the very beginning, I would pray at the lotus feet of our beloved Acharya Dev Param Pujya Pada Acharya Dev Sri Sri Dada and pray for the complete recovery so that we can enjoy his divine companionship for a long, long time to come. I feel extremely privileged to be in the midst of all of you today. I don't know whether I have any word whatsoever of addressing you because I do not have any spiritual practice as such in my own life. And this is contrary to what my dear friend Bashuri was saying. And I have not done anything for Sri Sri Thakur in my life. But I have enjoyed his divine grace throughout my life, nevertheless. And the very fact that I am alive today is by the grace of Acharya Dev Sri Sri Dada and Sri Sri Baba Ibn. I have gone through such turbulent times in my life that I had no chances of staying alive. And it is merely by his divine blessings that I am still alive. I was late in taking initiation and the fact that I could at least witness Sri Sri Dada and Sri Sri Babai Dada and Sri Sri Abhindada, at least through naked eyes, though I understand nothing of them, is purely because of my mother and friends like Chandrasekhar Bhashuri had actually handheld me in my early years and without their mentorship, I perhaps would not have been talking to you at all today. I have not achieved anything, but the very fact that I am in the midst of you is because of my mother and because of some of my most beloved friends like Chandrasekhar Vashuri. So I am indebted to all of them. So we are living through very difficult times and many of us in our daily lives are facing stress on almost an everyday basis. So we begin to wonder what exactly can make our life more blissful. The philosopher Socrates once said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So there is a need for delving deep 
into what potentially could be the causes of not enjoying life despite having material influences in our life i came across this story while browsing the web recently a farmer had a dog that loved chasing down any vehicle that used to come by barking and trying to overtake it one day a neighbor asked the farmer do you think your dog is ever going to catch a car the farmer replied that is not what bothers me what bothers me is this what would he do if he ever caught one in endlessly pursuing worldly goals in the name of name fame and riches one runs the risk of getting consumed in a rat race what is this rat race this is one in which no rat has the sign of any goal excepting that all others in the race have to be overtaken so we have got caught up in this rat race we obviously need some amount of money to sustain our families and there is no harm in going for it someone may need a business to support one's family but when expanding the business with the primary goal of maximizing profits and when that becomes an end in itself it is easy to get consumed in a rat race and lose awareness of the distinction between the means and ends one who is aware of this distinction can grow his business while ensuring that any such expansion happens organically in harmony with the environment without tormenting one's own state of blissfulness within in contrast one who is unaware runs the risk of getting upset over every setback at his workplace allowing it to affect the well-being of himself his family and his fellow men worse still such a person may be tempted to adopt unfair practices to realize his dreams oblivious of the fact that bliss was all that was needed in the first place the rest of his wants and desires were merely his own fanciful concoctions with us become conditioned on or enslaved to the external world because our inner state is dictated by what happens outside us so what is the way out the way out is to have some clarity between what constitutes success and what constitutes greatness we are always chasing for things that we can acquire from this world because that is the propensity of mind the mind tries to confine us with certain goals certain aspirations that are just good enough for the time being and for just few people around us in our family but that is not the inner craving of our soul of our being which in bengali we call satta the being the being is craving for something else the being is craving for expansion for growth it is hankering to go beyond these boundaries to transcend these boundaries and to encompass all the mind is tempting us to take from this world be it name fame riches whatsoever whereas the being is fulfilled only in giving so there is the take versus the give there is the mind versus the being and what do we give till we give out whatever we can to the best of our capacity given our inner instinctive traits we are not satisfied we are not happy we do not feel blissful inside we may have an ephemeral burst of happiness but we cannot be blissful inside there is a difference between happiness and bliss someone some scholar from the west had once said something like this i do not remember the exact quote but he said what we take from this world gives us our livelihood what we give to the world gives us our life so we are hankering for life 
and the tragedies that all our efforts are for our livelihood. So we have to understand this. If we look at our lives, we find that at the age of 20, when you are very young, we are running after our careers. After that, we have family and we are engaged in looking after our children, those of who we consider are near and dear, all our time, effort and everything is invested in that. And then there is professional life. And there are a lot of people who are running behind us, calling us, sir, sir. And we get accustomed to that addressing. And we think that is our identity. And then we happen to retire. And then we find that there is no one around us. Those people who were running after us, calling us, sir, sir, they no longer care because they had some selfish concerns because of which they were regardful of us. This is regard, not respect. Respect has to be earned. Regard can be because of one's position. So at the end of our life, we find that all these people are not around. And then we try to call up our children who perhaps are happily enjoying their lives somewhere else. And we yearn for their company. And they say they are busy in their lives and they will call us afterwards. Suddenly we find there is no one with us. This is not fiction. This is reality. And then we begin to wonder, what have we worked for all these years? So we had certain expectation from people whom we are surrounded by. And those expectations have got vitiated. And this is bringing us agony. But it is too late. Sri Ramakrishna tells us a very beautiful story. He tells that there were two people who set out from one of the ghats in the Ganges River. And they thought they will be sailing far with their little boat. And then all night long, they were essentially... trying to sail the boat across. And when it is morning, they find that the place where they are looks very familiar. And uh, looking around, they finally discover that they're exactly at the same place where they started. Then they realize that they were drunk. And this boat is essentially still tied to the shore. So it has not moved an inch throughout all their struggles throughout the night. So all of their effort essentially went in vain. So this is exactly what happens in our life. This is the analogy to what happens. A lot of effort, a lot of time is dissipated in things that essentially have amounted to nothing because we were essentially intoxicated with our passionate cravings. And we have not moved an inch. So this is primarily the reason why one needs to understand what the goal of life is at the very beginning of one's life, not when it is too late. And Sri Sri Thakur tells us that it is at the age of 12 that one should take initiation. And this gives us clarity in our thought process. So it doesn't mean that one doesn't engage in worldly life. Far from it. But everything that one does is essentially consecrated to his service. One does everything that one does to serve his cause. So Sri Thakur has left behind with him, the Acharya Parampara. He has not left us orphan. So the living embodiment of Sri Sri Thakur, his living presence 
is felt through Sri Sri Bhadda, Sri Sri Dada, Sri Sri Baba Dada, Sri Sri Abhinda. They are indistinguishable from Sri Sri Thakur. And when life becomes centered around sorry, the Acharya, then one finds meaning and purpose in life. So everything that one does is for his service, for making him happy. It's as simple as that. It sounds simple, but this is the essence of sadhana or our avowed activity. There is a way that Sri Sri Thakur has shown us and to live every moment according to how he likes us to live every moment is the essence of sadhana. And most of us who are initiated are aware of what Sri Sri Thakur likes. We know for it. So this is very practical. This is not a theoretical conception. Sri Sri Bhadda tries to clarify it, that there is no partitioning between there is no partition between our personal life, our everyday life, and what we say, Thakur's work. Every work, every breath is for him. So it has to be done in practice, not in theory. And it can only be done in practice when we have the divine companionship of Acharya. It cannot be done by reading books. It cannot be done by any amount of theorization, any amount of abstraction. That won't do any good to it. So what is this doing in practice? What is it realization in practice? It means that we are aware of what Sri Sri Thakur wants of us. I am feeling very sleepy at night. And I am almost falling asleep. Suddenly, I recall that I had to send an email or send a WhatsApp message to someone. I had committed to that. Now suddenly it flashes across my mind that Sistri Thakur doesn't write, like go between. The conflict between thought, word and action. This is something that he doesn't like. Can I make him primary in life? Shake off my sleep and get to business and get the job done. This is doing it in practice. I had a bad exchange of words with someone in office. And now it occurs to me that this is not how Sri Sri Thakur would have liked me to behave. Can I apologize in several people who are perhaps subordinates, a whole house full of people? Can I apologize that what I said was not right? What I thought was not right? This person was right. Can I say that? Can I gather enough courage in me to realize that, to, to, to materialize that in action? So all of these little things constitute service to him. Service to him doesn't necessarily mean just building big temples or all the rest of the paraphernalia that we talk about. It's about these little things. Sistrit Hakur is very categorical. He doesn't like abstractions. Because abstractions are our own fanciful concoctions. We use language to our convenience. And we have our own notions of what these things mean. This is not what Sri Sri Thakur is after. In Alochana Prasanga, the recorded discourses of Sri Sri Thakur, volume 10, Sri Sri Thakur says the following. The translation is something that may not be appropriate. I am trying to translate in my own words, but I hope you will get some amount of essence from what Sri Sri Thakur is trying to convey here. Those who take recourse to a guru, carrying with them fanciful preconceived notions of concepts, such as dharma, spirituality, God, self-realization, brahma jnana, sattvic lifestyle, saintliness, virtuous deeds, afterlife, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, karma yoga, pranayam, samadhi, and judge the guru in the yardstick of such preconceptions often deprive themselves. Someone may have come to me to learn the essence of spiritual practice and I may have asked him to cut grass for cows. He would have set out for the job out of his desire to accumulate virtues by obeying the commandments of the Guru. He gets late in returning from the fields 
and is suffering from hunger pangs. By that time, the Anand Bajar or the community kitchen and dining area is closed and the Brahmin cook is furious with him. At that very moment, he is overcome by pride, vanity, doubt and disbelief. That very night, he would have booked a ticket to return back, never to be seen here again. Once he is out of here, he may be telling people, are you talking of satsang? There is not an iota of dharma there. Satsang is all about material pursuits. I went to Thakur for learning the essence of spiritual practice. And all he asked me to do is to cut grass for cattle. Sri Sri Thakur says, they fail to see how much one can advance in sadhana or avowed practices in the practical sense of the term through perfectly and routinely cutting grass with sincerity in regulating his pride and vanity through action and in maintaining harmonious adjustment with his environment. This is the essence. Whatever he has asked us to do, to do that. And in the process, all the adjustment of the inner self happens automatically. Unquestioningly, if one can surrender at his feet, there is no one more blissful than that person. So there are three things that Sushri Thakur has emphasized on. One is Ishtabhridi, one is Jajan, and the other is Yajan. So I had basically mentioned earlier that one needs to know at an early age what is the significance of life, what is the meaning and purpose of life at the age of 12. When one does Ishtabriti, one reminds himself early in the day of that mission. That everything has come from him. We have come empty handed. And everything that we enjoy is because of him. And therefore everything we do has to be consecrated at his cause. To remind oneself of this mission in life is Ishtabriti. So to achieve success in life, to achieve true greatness in life, one needs to understand what is to be done and what is not to be done. This ability to discriminate what is to be done from what is not to be done, where exactly effort has to be invested, is essentially having clarity. And that clarity is something that is imperative. You cannot do without that clarity. Otherwise, all your time, effort, everything gets wasted, as we were discussing earlier. So if you have multiple focal points of attraction, each one will drag you in different directions and the resultant might be zero. So you'd have wasted a lot of time in your life. Anyone would have done that. But if you have only one center of attachment, and if this center of attachment is lofty, and the only goal of that loving, living center of attachment is to bring out the best in you according to your individual instincts and to fulfill the mission of your life. And there is no other agenda of that living and loving ideal. Then you attain fulfillment in life. And Ishtabriti reminds us of that ideal, of that idea, that this is the only place where effort has to be invested. So Ishtipriti brings in clarity about what needs to be done and what should not be done. You are for the Lord and not for others. You are for the Lord and so for others. You are for the Lord, not for others. You are for the Lord and so for others. Our Acharya Dev Sri Sri Dada says that Ravana lost his battle in Ramayan, not just because of Ram. I am translating again in my own words, so there could be some disturbances, but because he had 10 heads. So there were 10 focal points of attraction. So we need one point of attraction. So this is what is important, and this is what Ishtabriti does. In one of Sri Thakur's books, we find Sabse Rasye, Sabse Basye, Sabka Lijiye Naam, Haji Haji Katte Rakhye. 
बैठे अपना ठाउ टू फाइंड दैट प्लेस वेर वन कैन पोजिशन वन से दैट ब्रिंग्स इन इंटीग्रिटी इन लाइफ right so ishta vridhi makes us aware of what should be done and what should not be done once we have become aware of what should be done the next question is how can i become successful in that mission so for that achieve for achieving success two things are required the first thing is that i should overcome the barriers that come from within and the second thing is i should overcome the barriers that come from without from outside the barriers that come from within are in the nature of my passionate complexes lust greed jealousy delusion pride and so on and so forth so this is the first thing that i have to overcome all of this sister thakur says that if you start walking towards the north you will automatically start moving away from the south so if you are attached to the ideal and all your activities are consecrated at his service then you don't need to worry about your passionate complexes they will get adjusted on the own so everything that is done in the form of meditation is essentially for adjustment of inner complexes so jajan as we call it is for overcoming the inner barrier and this is one's own spiritual practice so that one can be in tune with the supreme being to be in synchronization to be receptive so this is yajan there are only two things there are only two entities in the world there is he and there is me there is nothing in between there is a beautiful song in bengali from our acharya dev tumake jokhon mone pore dhara mone hoy janoke when i get reminded of you this world appears barren i don't see anyone else to establish that intimate association with the supreme being with our only object of love is yaja the second aspect which is required for achieving success is to overcome barriers from outside and this is done through yajan because you cannot exist in this world in isolation your environment has to be exalted to ideal centric causes as well and to exalt your environment in such a way that they become concordant to your goals they become aligned to your goals they do not become hindrances in the path of realizing what you want to realize is yajan so ishta vritti gives us a direction of what needs to be done and what should not be done and once we understand what is to be done the path of success is ensured by yajan which overcomes inner barriers and yajan which overcomes barriers from outside this is how sri sri thakur has very shortly encompassed i mean encapsulated encapsulated the principles of spiritual life in just three essential principles then there are many others i am not getting into all of this but this is something that is fundamental so few important things are that there are these commandments which have to be obeyed in toto without any compromise and then there is this daily process of spiritual practice one cannot proceed in the spiritual path to obtain blissfulness without the guru it is next to impossible it is indeed impossible whatever we say gyana yoga bhakti yoga karma yoga all of it the essence is essentially to satisfy gyana yoga doesn't mean knowing about electrons protons and so on merely it means knowing something so well so that it can be used for his service that is the essence of gyana yoga 
everything has to be put to his service. Otherwise, that knowledge is useless. Without the Guru, one cannot proceed. Someone might say there is this Advaita Marga who do not believe in duality. But Sankaracharya, who is at the forefront of this Advaita movement, he says, Advaitan Trishu Lokeshu Nadvaitan Gurunangsa. That means you can practice Advaita with everything, but not with your Guru. With your Guru, you must regard him as outside you, and everything must be according to how he wants it. So this is fundamental. But at the heart of everything is simplicity. One who had accepts him with a simple heart is the one who is truly privileged. Swami Vivekananda once says that to attack someone else we need swords and shields but to inflict an injury on oneself one needs only a needle. Similarly, sometimes to convince a whole house full of people you may need to read up a lot but to actually make way for him to rest in your heart so that you can feel his living presence at every point in time. To have that feeling at all points in time, all you need is simplicity. And for that, it is imperative to have the companionship of the Acharya. Sri Sri Bharda, I think, went to Bhuvaneshwar once and many people pleaded, can you please say a few words? And Sri Sri Bharda was very reluctant to speak in public, but he held the microphone in his hands. And he could only say something like Sri Sri Thakur. And then tears welled up in his eyes. And everyone around, thousands of people started crying with him. Such is the effect of Acharya because he is indistinguishable from Sri Sri Thakur. There is no distinction. We might have tall philosophical explanations of the word Acharya, but the essential truth is that there is no distinction. Same thing we can experience with Sri Sri Dada, Sri Sri Baba Dada, Sri Sri Abhinda. Unless we have this living ideal, unless we surrender at his feet, we do not have clarity of what is the meaning and purpose of things, why we are doing what we are doing. There was a man called Bikarsda. He was in Orisha and he booked a ticket to Jasidi. He was a worker and uh, his train was to go from Katak via Howrah to Jasidi, I think. But at Howrah, he got down from the train and he didn't have enough time to book a ticket for Jasidi. So he traveled without ticket to Jasidi and he reached Sri Sri Bharda and told him that I came here, but I couldn't book a ticket. Sri Sri Bharda sent him right back to the station and told him, you Book a ticket from Jasidi to Howrah and then tear that off and come back to me. Sometimes because of environmental pressures, we fail to understand what is right and what is wrong. This is a simple practical thing. When we have a guru in front of us, he reveals what is to be done and what is not to be done. This is a simple incident. But there is another interesting incident with, I think, the same person because that. He was about to build a center or something in Orissa somewhere and he had to put a boundary wall around the premises. But the villagers were essentially opposing the construction and they were demolishing that wall every time he was trying to construct it. So very frustrated with his experiences, this man came to Sri Sri Bhadda and told him, 
that this is what is happening. Then Sri Sri Bhadda told him that you go back and you file a case against these people and you win back the land. Now, this much is something that we all would perhaps do. We can perhaps think about it. But there is something else that Sri Sri Bhadda said. He said, after winning back the land in a legal process, return the land back to the villagers. And this is something that we perhaps would not have done. What is the essential purpose behind construction of these centers, these temples? When the land is reclaimed and it is returned back to the villagers, the villagers would begin to wonder. They would have that spark of curiosity. Who are these people? How can they do that? And then suddenly, they would develop in them the urge to find out more and take shelter of Sri Sri Thakur as well, which is the essential goal, not to leave anyone out. All of it is for all of them. So all the barriers have to be broken. And this is for this next level that we perhaps as normal human beings cannot anticipate. We would say, yeah, we'll fight a case. But after that, to return the land back, this is the second level. Albert Einstein once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking we used when we created them. And therefore, to make us move to the next level where we can see things with clarity, we need the Acharya Dev, for it is he who sees. We may not be able to see that he sees it. We may not be able to see what exactly he sees. But through our experiences, we find that yes, this was right. Ten years down the line, I understand why he might have actually asked me to do so and so. This is essentially something that almost all of us have experienced in our lives. Those who have gone to Acharya Dev or Sri Sri Babaida, or Sri Sri Abhindada. So, in order to attain bliss in our lives, in order to make our lives enjoyable for ourselves, enjoyable for all those around us, we need to have him at the center of our lives. Just as we could not explain the structure of the universe when we thought that the earth was at the center of this universe, we cannot explain what is going on around us unless we position him at the center of our life. And unless we enjoy ourselves, we cannot convey that sense of enjoyment or bliss to anyone. We cannot be a source of enjoyment to anyone at all. We would simply be deceiving ourselves. With these few words, I will pray at the lotus feet of our Acharya Dev for the well-being of all those who have assembled here. And I bow down to you in gratitude for offering me this opportunity to speak to you. I have not done anything in my life, so you'll have to excuse me for all my lapses. Jai Guru, Bande Purushottama. Jai Guru.